Welcome. Today, one year before the Green Tech Exhibition and Summit, we kick off at Koppert Kress in Munster. I'm Shinette Den Boer, member of Team Green Tech, and today I'll take you through the world of the horticulture forefront with four special guests. Let's find out their stories. Today's guests are Aoyan de Boer and Tracy Chung from Transactive to tell us more about future world trends and the impact on the horticulture industry. Mariska Dreschler, Group Director Horticulture at Rye Amsterdam. And Rob Baan, owner of Coppert Crest, the host of the beautiful location. Welcome everybody. Thank you. Aoyan, I actually want to start with you. Uh, you are a trend watcher. Can you tell us a little bit more about the future trends and developments, what you are researching? Well, looking at your industry and many of the industries, but looking at the horticulture industry and green technology, that would suggest that you focus on technology and how that is changing society or how that is changing human needs. But actually, it's the other way around. People what do you mean by that? that? That when people have new needs, so for example, they want to have healthier food, then we need technology to provide that. Technology always serves a purpose for mm. a human need. So what we do is we start at the human needs and how that is changing and then decide which kind of technology could be applied on fulfilling that need. But, but can you explain why that is changing? Well, if you look at uh, the, the future of your industry, um, then we could, for example, look at the future generations and the people that are now in kindergarten or people that are graduating from university or young families. The people in, in these generations are, we call them millennials, people between 20 and 35 years old, or Generation Z, people below 20 years old. Uh, what is it that they want and how that is changing? Yeah, but what would you adv advise, for example, businesses in the horticulture industry to uh, react more on these trends? Uh, how can they reach the, mille the millennials or Generation Z better? Well, I think that uh, one thing they should be aware of is that uh, we're all trying to build a brighter future and feed that 9 billion people. But in that, we see that uh, there is a, a mentality difference between those two gen generations. So millennials tend to be a bit more optimistic about the future. That's partly because of their, uh, the way they were uh, raised by baby boomers, which are very uh, positive about the future yeah. too. But Generation Z is much more realistic. So they will be kind of skeptical when you tell your dreams about building a brighter future and creating a healthy world, they will think, okay, so what is it that you actually do? Put your money where your mouth is. Don't just talk, but show me your actions. So that if you understand that mentality and the difference between that, you also understand how you could market your products better to your consumer or to your business to business client, or even to engage your employees behind the ambition that you yeah. have as a company. Well, it's interesting. We have a, a, a horticulture lead, leading company here at the table, Rob. Uh, how do you do that? The essence of, of producing food is that you provide health. If you look at, at the world, how horticulture started, it's about 10,000 years ago. It's, not, it's a young industry. Yeah. If you look at what a human being needs to eat, it means 80% plants, 20% animals. That's the balance of our food. That's what you would hunt when you were naked, without a machine gun and without a, 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 a Nikes. And, and how is it now? What's the, what's uh, the to give an idea, you can feed a city like Rotterdam with one million people, you can feed it with 2,000 hectares of greenhouses yeah. and outdoor vegetables. 200 hectares of glasshouse and 1,600 hectares of outdoor. They don't eat that, they eat a half. So they eat 1,000 hectares of vegetables. But they, they eat they more... Do, but they do eat 70,000 hectares of meat. And how so much would so they need? Uh, 10,000? Okay. Plenty. That means if you look at the world health problem, many diseases are uh, non-transferable -transfer diseases, like uh, diabetes 2, cancer, those things. They're not caused by your environment, they're caused by your food. So if you bring back the food to the real origin again, you come to the most important staple food of humans. We are meat to eat plants, 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 and something that runs, flies, or swims slower than you in your naked butt, without a Nike and without Kalashnikov. <laughs> if you keep it in your mind for a plate, you're there. And that plate is more or less decided by the producer, the chef who inspires you, and the doctor, dietitian who says how the plate should be like. And then horticulture is key, is the most important part of your plate, most important part of your health. The Netherlands alone, and it's a small country, has more than one million 
people with diabetes too, which can be reversed for 80% within a few weeks by just eating more plants and less other stuff. We are the key producer of the base of the food. And but actually, there's not the awareness of no, that. No, but, but there's another thing. I mean, you're here surrounded with green, green plants. This is a really an oxygen provider. You get a lot of oxygen. You feel very comfortable when you walk in the forest or when you're outdoors. You feel comfortable because your, your lungs are good, your brain is working because you get oxygen. When you're in a dense city, there's no oxygen. So the thing that horticulture is doing is providing health and happiness. And as we are looking at the trends we were just talking about, yeah. so the trends, uh, the millennials and the yeah. Generation Z, where you have to uh, react differently on, how does copper do that? Well, um, I'm a small operation. Uh, it looks big, but it's, it's a small operation. I can't reach every consumer. So we focus this moment on the restaurants. We have an organization that's called Dutch Cuisine, based, organized by chefs, telling we have to make the plate again a healthy thing. And, um, and but is that the way you try to uh, make more awareness at, uh, at the, the people uh, that around the world? Or yeah, that, that's, that's for me easy, because my products are well known to chefs, so I'm one, one relation. So for me, um, um, how you call it, uh, G to R, so grower to a restorator, yeah. that, that's easy. Yeah, because I know them, and they know me, so we have a good connection. But grower uh, to the younger gener generation? Well, there's another step in between, which is also very important. Doctors have no clue about food. Doctors are trained seven hours in a seven years career to become a trained doctor on food. And very often it's on medical food. So my biggest challenge now is B to D, business to doctors. Yeah. How to bring back vegetables into the uh, place where doctors are telling what to eat. When you go to with your dog to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the vet and the dog is like this, the doctor says, what do you feed that animal? Yeah, but if you go to the doctor, he will never tell you what do you eat. Or well, maybe a little bit less. So don't, you try to, some, yeah? to create more awareness. So we have to bring food yeah. really back on the plate. Thank you. Well, mm. Mariska, I'm actually also uh, wondering how green tech uh, uh, does react on the new generation, uh, Z and uh, the millennials Arjen was talking about. Well, it's of course very important to look at uh, well the, the new professionals that uh, that come to our industry, and uh, therefore actually we um, launched the online community uh, with new marketing communication tools to uh, to really get interactive, much more interactive with uh, with the target groups, and especially the the, the younger ones um, because they like to be uh, interactive and they like to be online. And yeah, we have once in the two years a show at the moment, but we should be there much more frequently. And with the community, we are able to uh, to do that. So you do that also by uh, showing more videos and be uh, in that way more interactive, because I think the, the, the new generation is interested in that, right? More yeah, they grew up video, with, that yeah. with being interactive. That's uh, yeah. almost a basic human need for them. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh, it's storytelling and it's uh, blogging. It's uh, also the, the matchmaking tools. So and it's not only interesting for the for the younger people, but also for uh, for me, for example, for for everybody in the industry and of course crossovers outside the industry to have a look at what uh, horticulture has to offer. And it's really a lot. And we can contribute with the community to uh, to that. Well, let's have a look. Mm -hmm. Give an idea of how Green Tech will connect visitors and exhibitors year-round uh, at the Green Tech community with a How It's Made video. With Redu Systems products, Mardenkro specializes in adjusting solar radiation to the needs of the crops both in glass and plastic greenhouses. Redu Systems is the name of a group of coatings that give the grower more control over their greenhouse climate and is used in more than 60 countries. Each product starts with an idea. From the idea to a coating is a long road. After two to three years of testing in the lab, it usually moves on to small-scale tests in practice and trial stations. It takes about three to four years before you are ready to launch a product onto the market. The Mardenkro Laboratory has an important function in monitoring the quality of the Regi systems. The quality control starts by testing the incoming raw materials that will be used in the production process. All raw materials are sampled and checked for specific properties and various advanced analytical methods are used for this. Only when the raw material has been approved is it used for manufacturing. 
At the factory, the raw materials are fully mixed. All mixing tanks are equipped with weighing systems so that the recipe can be carefully monitored. Through the central pipe system, the products are transported to the filling station. The warehouse contains thousands of samples that are stored for several years. Every end product that leaves the factory is checked first. After all the tests are approved, the buckets are filled and transported to the customer. Well, Tracy, you uh, work together with uh, Aoyan, and Aoyan already told us a bit about uh, a couple of trends and uh, developments you see, you notice right now. Uh, can you tell other trends you notice? Yeah, so indeed. Um, there are two trends I could think of right now in the top of my head, which I think are quite relevant in this context. The yeah. first one is what we call the lack of trust societal trend. And, and wh what is that? Um, basically, uh, in a nutshell, we notice that there is a decline of trust in society. The public sentiment is that um, they don't really trust big corporations or big institutions or governments. Um, and is it for the whole society or is it more for the younger generation? Um, because it's a societal trend and we do but uh, observe and based on research that it does affect all generations, not just millennials and generations see that Ayan earlier talked about, but other generations, uh, so baby boomers, generation X. So it's just a societal trend. So we'd say that's a general trend we see in the society as and a whole. And can you tell us uh, 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 why that is? Um, based on research, uh, there are some... We think this lack of trust trend started in 2008, so that corresponds with the financial crisis, and mm -hmm. from then we, it's also reported by the media a lot that we see a lot of uh, political scandals or public scandals. There's just a lot of negativity going on. We can see the, um, the climate cr uh, change crisis and a lot of uncertainty, and I think uh, with this volatility, uh, consumers are really lacking trust. And how can uh, businesses... Um uh, yeah, react on, on, on this trend, for example. Yeah, so tr trust is really definitely uh, an important element because <clears throat> it really affects how consumers interact with the brand or what the consumer loyalty and whether they buy their products, for example. Um, and we have three advice we give in terms of how to build trust and rebuild trust again. Uh, one is authenticity. So consumers nowadays, are they're looking at a company or a brand um, they're scrutinizing whether the brand is just uh, delivering what they say they are delivering. So is the product they're delivering actually has good quality or is it competent? But besides that, they also look for benevolence. So they want to have an emotional connection with the company and they want to see whether the company is actually genuine in what they're doing. Are they actually incentivized or motivated uh, out of uh, like an authentic concern that, or that they actually care about the consumer's uh, interests and then the, the causes that they find important. So they look at, like I said before, how authentic this company is besides uh, economic uh, motives, for example. So you advise companies to be more uh, authentic. Well, we that's a quite a difficult yes. uh, advice. Yeah, or, or <laughs> very easy, just be yourself. Have a dream yeah, and stick to it. Yeah. It's very easy, I mean, I like cooking, but uh, I would never make a dish with 27 ingredients. You never make a dish with 27 ingredients. So if you buy something in a shop with 27 ingredients, you have to wonder why they are there. Because it tastes better? And no? why, are, why are they there? Well, very often because it makes the production process easier. It's, you can store the, pr the product longer. Uh, <coughs> you will eat more from it, what you normally wouldn't do. There are all kinds of but reasons behind healthier. it. But nothing is about are you making it for your, for your grandchild or for your sick mother? If you mix something which you can't feed with, with a smile on your face to your grandchild or your sick mother, you have to think for yourself, what are you doing? That's, that's for me, it's so basic. I don't produce anything which I wouldn't advise anybody not to eat. You can't do that. Yeah. And that's, if that's your drive, because it makes money, then you have to look in the mirror if you're doing the right thing. So it's not customized enough yet, and that's uh, a big opportunity actually yeah, yeah, for But it's uh, so simple. Everybody. Think about your grandchild mm -hmm. and think about your mother. Yeah, and the rest is not important. If they would eat it, or you say, well, eat it once a week. Then yeah? it's not good. Then, yeah. you, know, then yeah. you know you're doing something, and then you have an advertising de department behind you who makes sure everybody eats it once a week, <laughs> twice a week, or three <laughs> times, or seven times a week. Oh, we double the seven times a week. That's wrong. Yeah, so being uh, authentic 
It's actually really easy. It's just being yourself. Being yourself, yeah. And, and what's the other advice? Um, and trans being transparent. And I think this actually uh, strikes a chord with millennials and uh, Generation C because like I, uh, Alian mentioned earlier, they have access to information which is facilitated yeah. by technology. So then if you're hiding something, one way or another, they'll they will be, find, they out. Will find out. And being transparent, um, it actually helps not just to build trust, but also helps rebuild trust. And of course, nothing, uh, maybe there are certain shortcomings in the industry. I mean, it's okay to be transparent out of about it rather than covering it up. Um, so you have a good example of a, of a company who did it very well last, uh, uh, last year. The whole crisis around horse meat in your hamburgers. Yeah. Where, where a lot of uh, companies were, uh, yeah, consumers were really mad. <laughs> they were felt screwed by the, by the industry that, that the thing that, was that they were eating was not the thing that they thought they were eating. And uh, what we saw is that um, uh, that is very bad for your image. So, for example, Tesco, big retailer from the UK, they decided to say, OK, we're sorry and uh, we're going to do everything to, to rebuild trust and we're being very transparent about how we're going to do that. So that, that's one example. And uh, yeah, the other one really good is uh, Tony Sugar Lonely. Yeah. It's a chocolate brand here in the Netherlands. They're starting now in the US. And they really want to, um, well, their ambition is to uh, create a 100% slave-free chocolate. Yeah. And what they're doing is they're making their whole supply chain more transparent. So they really tell you how much profit do they make, how much money goes to the cocoa farmers, and yeah, they're very transparent about who they are. And one funny thing, for example, is that when they have their uh, shareholder meetings, that normally you won't see consumers coming there. But at Tony Shaw Colony, this is almost a festival. So you have 5,000 consumers yeah, I saw <laughs> going on all Facebook. crazy on, yeah. on, this, on this chocolate brand because it's really appealing to that trust issue. Yeah. They really try to say, this is just who we are and trying to build You have to wonder industry. how much sugar is in Tony Shaw Colony. That is absolutely correct. <laughs> and people do wonder about that uh, as well, yeah. But if they decide to indulge themselves, uh, once in a while, then they'll probably choose for the, yeah, the more. What will happen if Tony Chocolaty becomes a world big brand? That's uh, I hope and they will be. And people start eating more chocolate because it's a big brand. Yeah, that 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 is one of those challenges. Yeah, especially with Gen Z. Yeah, the, what we talked about before is uh, obesity is becoming a big problem. It's a huge them. problem. They they run uh, less on their Nikes, sitting more on their iPads. We were yeah. talking about earlier, and. Uh, and they eat the uh, chocolates and stuff, and uh, yeah, that that's a uh, that's a yeah. danger. So you could wonder for your uh, from your industry perspective, hey, this is actually a change in human behavior, and it probably a need for mothers that are feeding these kids. So how can we how, how can, can we, we tap into yeah. that? What is it that we can do? And then maybe I can make a can step back to the third uh, yeah, advice the that we yeah. often give, is that uh, about purpose? Eh? It's a uh, yeah, maybe you can tell uh, a bit more Yeah, about so that. as I said earlier, uh, consumers are looking at not just what the companies can deliver on a functional level, but are they investing in what consumers care about? Or, um, for example, are they uh, engaging in social causes that people find important or environmental uh, issues? How are companies um, operating not just to increase profits and in revenues, but how are they actually giving back? And um, Yeah giving back and benefiting or trying to increase the well-being of in the of the communities that they operate in so yeah. I, we, that's kind of relating to CSR and so all th these things they uh, help actually in the in the trend lack of trust uh, all the other the, these yeah. were the examples yeah you could say we're going to make the world a healthier place but you can also organize sports days or create things or apps that help people to do more sports and then eat healthier food so yeah. it, it it's more a philosophical issue that you could tackle than just producing products and, and, and ship it. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. What we try to do on this topic, you have been having lunch over here on top of our uh, restaurant. Um, I, I challenged the Dutch government, effectively the tax department, because I provide this food, the health food, for free. The other food you have to pay for. For all it. your employers. Yes, but it's for free, which is not allowed. Yeah, because that's not you allowed, have to eh? charge. Yeah. Yeah, I have to pay tax on that. And uh, because they see it as a kind of secondary uh, yeah, beneficial. Uh, so I pay 80% tax on the food I provide, which is healthy. Now, I'm going to refuse that. 
So for the tax attorneys, uh, this is going to be your problem. <laughs> um, I will not pay tax on health food. And how did the, uh, the, the, the tax man uh, react on Th that? They're still confused. So okay. I, have to, I, have to, I maybe have to go, like Tony Chocologian, because it's is inspiration for me, I maybe have to go into the field to turn myself in and say, yeah. sorry, punish me because I yeah. failed to. <laughs> but just think about it. All the food, three million people in the Netherlands are eating at lunchtime food, which is cheap because otherwise you have to pay too much tax. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just imagine you make it fantastic food, you don't tax it, and you, and you standardize it, or you, you give it a kind of uh, re reward or, 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 or a brand or whatever, or you say the certification. But what, what yeah. that would do with the health of the people in the Netherlands, you mean? 5.3 million people in the Netherlands have chronic diseases based on food. 5.3 out of yeah, 17. That's absurd. We can reduce the health cost maybe with 10, 20 million billion euros by eating better and, and, active and being active and so on, so sporting and so on. And we shouldn't tax that. So we, we almost I punish. We almost punish. Well, uh, I have to get provide my people uh, shoes, safety shoes, to protect their toes, mm. clothes to protect their, their body, but I'm not allowed to protect their organs, which are very crucial. Yeah, you better have you lose one toe, then you lose your heart. I mean, that's that's quite yeah. basic. <laughs> so, if you can provide people with better food, you can solve so much. And this knowledge is not not in our society yet. So I spent quite some energy on this one. But it's fun. It, it really, it's the big picture. Yeah, and I it's think it's a, a great example of a company that really takes a stance and almost is doing politics. Because yeah. whereas the yeah. people don't uh, are lacking trust in governments, you will find more and more companies saying, okay, this is something we want to change in society. Yeah. Whether I get fined for it or not, this is my dream. And yeah. it's very actually very appealing for employees from the millennial generation because they like to work for a purposeful company yeah. and not just for big bucks or, yeah. There was a, a fourth uh, uh, trend, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think it echoes really well with uh, providing healthy food for your employees because um, actually we call this trend the quest for happiness trend. Can you shortly or briefly yeah. explain one, it? One characteristic is that there's people have a different uh, approach to what health and happiness means. It's a more holistic approach. And to say it really short, people now seeing that if you're a healthier person, you're going to be happier. And in turn, if you're a happier person, you're also going to be healthier. So people are starting to pay more attention to what they eat because they see that if their diet is healthy, it's going to make them a more positive, happier person. And the other way around, if you're happier, you're also more likely to have um, find it or uh, go look for healthier food to incorporate in your diet. So yeah, so all these trends actually connect with each other mm -hmm. and also definitely with the horticulture industry. It's yeah, the basis. Indeed. Yeah, we are the basis and we, we we tend to look at how to produce more, how to produce more efficient, how to use less chemicals and so on. But the real thing is the essence. We produce health and happiness. But actually, uh, most of the horticultural industry is not uh, telling that to, the, to their customers. No, because the customers are big corporations or supermarkets who have no time to explain these things. They want the product, equal, yeah. good quality, provided on time, well done, no uh, residues. So th th we're doing it, but we don't make it our own pride. We're not proud enough on it. So this, this, this so proudness, that's a great this challenge proudness for I, want to, I want to reckon horticulture. Um, if I go to China, and I worked in China a long time, if I go in China, in Beijing, and I, and I knock at third floor on the, on the building on the back end side, and I say, I come from Holland, they say Holland. They say, Holland, horticulture. They say it yeah. in, in one time. When I tell them the Hague, I'm a grower, they say, couldn't you go to school or something? Or what went wrong? Yeah, we're actually not yeah? proud on our industry. We are not, not proud, proud and, and, and abroad, Netherlands is the place to be. I have now a delegation from India sitting behind me uh, in my company. They want to see how we do it because they want to study it, because they want to bring it to India, which is fantastic. A vegetarian yeah. country for a horticulture company. Paradise. Yeah, we yeah, are. We should be more and more proud in our industry. Yes, yes. Well, well, Holland is really the, the Silicon Valley of, uh, of horticulture, and we should really, really emphasize that and uh, put that on stage. Definitely. Well, Mariska, yeah. how will we do that? How will we, uh, the 11th of June, we have the summit. That's the right. The 11th of June, 2018. 
Uh, will this be a topic during the summit? Uh, definitely, it will be a topic. Um, yes Can you today. first of all actually explain yeah. a bit uh, more what the summit will, what what it is? Well, the summit will be the perfect place to address um, really urgent and high-level topics. So we are able on horticulture technologies, of course, but um, we will uh, we will be able to uh, to attract the top level growers, uh, the stakeholders that are involved in crossover industries and uh, uh, as well as governments. And we can uh, make people aware of what is happening in horticulture, but also with the, the goal to how to feed the world, of course, in 2050 with the 9 billion people. But we want to make it more practical. What, it is, what, is, what is it really looking like? And uh, we want to strive for 2028 and invite all the companies, all the, the growers that do have very practical insights of, of, of how we can really produce better and safer food. And will uh, happiness, for example, will also be a subject during uh, the summit, you think? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's one part of, of reaching the consumer and make people aware of, of, of what they are eating. So yeah, it's an integral part of, of the approach. Yeah, definitely. And uh, the summit will be the day before the Green Tech show starts? Yes, that's right. Um, what can people expect of the Green Tech exhibition coming uh, year? Well, during the exhibition, all technologies and innovations in horticulture, uh, so for producing flowers and, uh, and crops, are all central stage, actually. The best uh, suppliers in, in horticulture technologies, that's, that's one. Uh, there's about 450, we expect, but it's really like market leaders, innovators, and, uh, well, also the Formula One of, uh, of, of Holland. Um, well, 11,000 to 12,000 um, professionals from horticulture and uh, outside the horticulture industry who are interested to, uh, to really network, but also find practical solutions for, yeah, for, for the next generations. Uh, we have an extensive knowledge program with all kinds of topics uh, on themes. They are very sustainable, uh, the themes uh, on water, energy, uh, well, uh, people and um, uh, crop optimization. And uh, yeah, and we will focus a lot on innovations. There's a lot of innovations uh, by the suppliers, but also by startups, etc. So we will have an innovation lab with startup companies. Yeah. Um, during this year, when you apply uh, at our community, we will uh, keep you informed about, uh, well, the, the latest trends. Good. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank, thank you. you. This brings us to the end of the program. If you want to stay informed, please register here for the newsletter. Thank you for watching and hope to see you next time.